Uh, we're in Matthew chapter 2. We're getting very close to the Christmas season, and I just I thought this would be good to, uh, to look at. And so we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2, uh, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. And I'm trying to... There we go. I didn't know how to... Uh, all right. Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. And this morning, the, the lesson is centered around the wise men. And we're going to be looking at who the wise men were, because there's a lot of misconceptions uh, as to who they were. And so we're going to look at that this morning. Matthew chapter 1, I'm sorry, chapter 2, beginning of verse 1. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Now remember... If you know anything about what the people were expecting of Christ, they were expecting him to come and set up an earthly kingdom. That's not what he came for. Okay, He came to set up a spiritual kingdom. Uh, verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, and when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, also something else. Notice it says young child. It doesn't say baby. It just says young child. With Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. I'm just kind of concentrating this morning on this particular part of the Christmas story. Um, and kind of basically what we're going to be talking about is that by the time we're finished this morning, hopefully um, you will be able to know what the Bible says about who the wise men were uh, or the Magi. And that um, uh, basically uh, that we will, instead of just worshiping Christ this time of the year uh, and thinking about his birth this time of the year, uh, hopefully we will do that all year long. Um, and so we're going to look at that this morning. All right. Who were the wise men? Yes, sir. Why is it important that it, that it said young child instead of baby? We're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, and and that, that's, that's a good question. And I, I, I proposed that question or made that comment so that we would kind of focus on that or think about that for a moment, okay? All right, so who were the wise men? Um, there are misconceptions as to who they were. Number one, the three wise men, uh, I'm sorry, these were three wise men or magi. It is true that the Bible names three gifts. Um, second century artwork portrays two to four magi. In other words, there's three gifts, but some people, um, instead of saying that there were three wise men, there could have been more wise men. Okay, The Bible doesn't say that there are or they're not, but the general consensus is that there were probably more than three, but they brought three gifts to him. Okay, And so some people will say, well, there were only three wise men. Well, it's not specific about that. There could have been more. Um, the Bible does not tell us an exact number, okay? So even though there were three gifts, there could have been more wise men, all right? Uh, there's another misconception uh, that says they were kings, okay? Uh, we are familiar with the Christmas story, We Three Kings. It's true that the nature of their gifts, which was gold, frankincense, and myrrh, uh, suggests that they're wealthy men, okay? But it doesn't necessarily mean that they were kings. They were simply wise men. But you hear it all the time, the three kings. But the Bible mentions the three wise men. They had to have been wealthy to bring these gifts, but they were not necessarily royalty as in kings. Who were the wise men? 
Some think that they were probably astronomers from Persia because they looked at the stars. Okay, In order to be able to see what was going on and when Christ was going to be born, they were studying the stars. So some think that they were astronomers uh, from Persia. And in addition to being very skilled with science and, and the heavens, the stars, they also learned philosophy, science, medicine. Um, so the fact that there was a misconception that some people say that there were the three kings, that's not necessarily so. Okay. Uh, so there, those are two so far that they were there were three of them which the Bible does not specifically say there could have been more that they were kings the Bible is not specific it says they were kings it just said that they were wise men all right and then number three some of you may not have heard this but there are some that will say they they will tell their names that their names were Casper uh, Melkor and Bel I'm sorry ba Balthazar okay. That is another misconception. These names were popularized, and the reason that we that we hear these names today is because they were popularized um, by Amal and the night visitors. Their names actually come from seventh century manuscript, and so that's why people say, "Well, this must have been the wise men," and that was their names. There was an actual obituary notice prepared, having undergone many trials and fatigues of the gospel. The three wise men met in A.D. 54 to celebrate the Feast of Christmas. Thereupon, after celebrating the celebration of Mass, they died. Melchior, on January 1st, age 116 years old. Bel, uh, Balthazar, on January 6th, age 112. And Gaspar, on January 11th, age 109. This is in a, a writing, uh, old writing, um, that was entitled... Uh, Amal and the night visitors, okay? And so, but the Bible is not specific about their names. We get their names because people think because of this writing that that was what their names were. And that is not simply not true because the Bible is not specific about what their names were. All right? The Bible also, there's a misconception that these men rode camels in. Well, the Bible doesn't say what they rode. They could have walked. It's not specific about that, okay? There's another misconception that the star they saw was in the east. Again, we, we sing, or there is a familiar song, Star of the East. Actually, the star was in the west. The wise men were in the east when they saw the star. Okay? So they're in the east, they see the star in the west, and they follow the star. Okay? So that's another misconception. Another one, Jesus, uh, or, sorry, they found Jesus in the manger. Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds were also there all on Christmas Day. Well, that is not necessarily true, and here's the reason. The Bible teaches that the shepherds were the only ones to visit the manger on the night of Christ's birth. Okay, um, The wise men visited Jesus sometime later while they were living in a house. The biblical order of events surrounding the birth of Christ are as follows. Jesus was born. Number two, the angels appeared to, to, uh, to the shepherds. Number three, the shepherds visited, um, you know, the shepherds visit Christ. Their sign was the manger, not the star. Eight days later, Jesus is circumcised. Six weeks later, Jesus is consecrated in the temple. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus go back to Bethlehem to live in a house. That is when the wise men arrive. So, the wise men arrive between six months and two years after Jesus was born. Some people, when you hear about the Christmas story, you think of all these things happening, just boom, 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 right after the other. And that's just not the case. So between six months to the time that Jesus was six months old and two years old, that's when the wise men came. Now, we see it in the Christmas story because it just, I don't know, it just seems like, you know, it is part of the Christmas story because it's part of Christ's, not just his birth, but his young age-ness, if you will. And so that's the reason they usually include that in the Christmas story. But it's not, it, they didn't visit him the night of his birth, okay? All right. All right, let's see where we're going now. Um, we have assumed a lot. So the Christmas story is biblically incorrect. <clears throat> if, if it includes the wise, the wise men as well, if, if you're saying that it was on that particular night, okay, because it wasn't, it had to have been at least six months after he was born, according to what we know about the timeline. Okay, um, 
But it's still, they visited him. And I guess that that's the reason that they included in the Christmas story was because they did visit him. But it was a little bit later. Okay. All right. Um, we, we have assumed a lot as it, as it pertains to the wise men. Let's see what the Bible actually says. We read Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It says, let's see who the wise men were and what attitudes uh, they had that we can emulate. Okay? The wise men are really kind of mysterious because we don't know a whole lot about them. There are many things we don't know, but we do know one thing. They were searching diligently for that one to be born who was the king of the Jews. And in our search for Jesus, let me suggest three things, three attitudes that I believe the wise men displayed that we ought to display. So we're bringing it down to where we are today. I always love taking the Word of God, and there are always applications. You may say, well, I'm not a wise man. What's this got to do with me? Well, there's always applications that we can take the Word of God and apply to our lives. And there are basically three things that I think as we look at how the wise men <laughs> reacted to Christ's birth, I think it's three ways we ought to be able to react as well, okay? Um, number one, the wise men had an um, attitude of urgency. It was like they had, to, they had to find this child. They saw the star in the east, and they, you know, um, they, they had to come and find him. These men were not Jewish. These men were Gentiles. You think of the, I guess you think of being in the Middle East, you know, that they were Jewish men because they were looking for the Messiah. They knew of the prophecies, and so therefore they must have been Jewish people. These were probably Persian men. So they were Gentiles. They were not Jewish people. But there was an urgency about them that they wanted to find the Christ child. Um, God gave them a star. God answered what they wanted. They wanted to know him. They wanted to find him. And God gave them a way to find him. They gave the star, okay? Or God did. Herod, the chief priest and the scribes, sensed their eagerness and their mission, their desire to want to find him. And they came a long way and made great personal sacrifice. They weren't just passing through or just in the area by happenstance. They were searching for Christ, okay? So they had an urgency. They wanted to find the king. I wonder, in, do we have an urgency not, I mean, obviously we have found Christ as our personal Savior. But is there an urgency about us to want to know Him better and to want to... And I can say, honestly, for y'all in here, I think there is a desire and there is an urgency uh, that you want to know Him more and you, you sense the urgency of growing in your relationship with the Lord. Okay? So there was a sense of urgency and we need that sense of urgency. What sense of urgency do we place on our relationship with Jesus? I have mentioned before, there are people that are just, they're like Christian on steroids. I mean, it's like they can't get enough of Christ. They can't get enough of growth in their Christian life. And then you've got others who you think, man, are they even alive spiritually? You're, and you're thinking, there is no desire. They don't ever talk about the Lord. There's no desire in their life to even want to get better, want to grow as a Christian. And so... Uh, but you've got, you got extremes. The problem is those, those who really long after a relationship with Christ, sometimes we have a sense to look at someone else because they may not be where we are and we're impatient with them. And I don't believe that's biblically right either. I think we ought to encourage people to grow in their relationship with the Lord and we ought to encourage them to have a sense of urgency as they pursue their relationship with the Lord. But we've got to be careful uh, how we do that. Okay. Um, what priority do you give your relationship with Christ? We know from the scripture, if it is anything less than putting him number one, then we've got it all me messed up. It doesn't matter uh, other priorities that we have as long as Christ is number one. Maybe I shouldn't have said it that way because priorities are definitely important. When I think about my priorities, my number one priority is my relationship with Christ. And what I mean by that is my personal relationship with Him. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about my personal relationship with Jesus. What I put second in my priorities is my family. And after my family comes church. And some people say, well, how can you separate a personal relationship with Jesus and church? Well, you, definitely you can. All right? Because we, 
We are a part of the body of Christ. All right? But you think about it like this. What, was, what did God ordain after He created this world and after He, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, well, it was actually before that, but anyway, in Genesis 3, 15, it talks about the fact that you know Adam and Eve sinned, they fell, it plunged the whole human race into sin, but Genesis 3.15 talks about the fact that one day God's going to send Christ and he is going to crush the serpent's head and have victory over him. So that is the prophecy, the first prophecy we have of Jesus coming later on. Okay, But if you back up a little bit, Jesus created us. He created the world. He created everything in it. What is the, the first institution that God established in, in the book of Genesis? The first institution. Husband and wife, the family. Okay? So, and then later on in the New Testament, there was one other institution that he established, and it is the church. That is the body of Christ. And so, I guess in my mind, that's why my relationship with Christ is, is number one, my family is number two, and the church is number three. Okay? Um, and so, anyway, that's just kind of the way I, I put things in my life. Um, all right. Um, I'm trying not to get ahead of myself here. Okay. Number two. Number one, the wise man had an urgency, an attitude of urgency. Number two, the wise man had an attitude of joy. An attitude of joy. Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 10 said, When they saw the star, they stopped over where the house was, where the young child was, and the Bible says that they were overjoyed. They were joyful about finding the Christ child. They had a thrill of victory. This was it. This was the end of their search. And many will say this was not a search of like a couple of days or a couple of weeks. They were searching for a long time for Christ to come. Okay? They were searching for a long time. They had found the one for whom they had been looking for for months, possibly even years. When you're waiting for someone, the anticipation and excitement builds. And uh, there's a personal story in here about a pastor who remembered when his children were waiting for their grandparents to arrive at home at the home at their home on Christmas Eve. Hours before they were due to come, they would stand in the window watching and waiting. They didn't take their eyes off of the street. When they saw them, they were overjoyed and uh, were so happy to see their grandparents that they would run and grab them and hug them um, and actually knocked them over at times. The question is, do you or do I have the fresh joy that comes from knowing Jesus? Here's the reason that I say this. Because I think there are times that we lose not just the sense of urgency of our relationship with Christ, but it's like our joy is gone. It's like, you know, we've known Christ for a number of years and it almost becomes mundane. And the joy and the excitement that we once had is not there anymore. And so... We need a sense of renewal and our joy of the Lord. What does the Bible say? The joy of the Lord is our strength. And a lot of times we allow our circumstances to dictate what that joy is or isn't. When we can have joy no matter what our circumstances are. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. I'm sure Miss Dixie had some pretty rough days over the last few weeks. But you know what? I guarantee you it didn't steal her joy because she knows the Lord. And it should not, any of us, it should not steal our joy because we know the Lord. And um, we need a sense of joy. Do we get to the point where we're so joyful about our relationship with the Lord that we sometimes skip a meal just because we're studying a passage or reading a passage and we forget? I, I, I'm there. I have been there. You know. Um, and so the joy that we have in wanting to, to grow in our relationship with Him, is He constantly on our minds and on our hearts? Absolutely. He should be, because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so it's important, not only that there be a sense of urgency, but that there be a sense of joy when we think about the Christ child, when we think about our Lord and Savior. If we have the joy of the Lord, is it not or should it not be contagious? Absolutely. If we want people to come to know the Lord... Man, all they got to do is look at our lives and think, man, they're joyful all the time. Doesn't matter what's going on in their life. That's what I need. That's what I want. 
And so there is a sense of being contagious in the fact that we're showing the joy of the Lord, uh, not just around, centered around the birth of Christ, but we're thinking about the joy of the Lord all year long. We're thinking about what Christ came and what we have as a result of what he came to do for us. Um, number three, the wise men had an attitude of worship. An attitude of worship. Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, it says they told Herod that they had come to worship him. We worship God not just this morning, not just in the service to follow. Our worship ought to be 24-7. Listen, I remember last night, I, um, I actually woke up in the middle of the night, and all of a sudden a sermon popped into my mind. I couldn't go back to sleep. I mean, I, I dozed off, and then I woke back up again, and I'm like, I'm still thinking about this particular message and this particular sermon topic, and I just, you know, I just begin to think about the Lord and begin to pray, and, you know, it's just an awesome thing. Always be in an attitude of worship. Verse 11 said, when they found the child, they bowed down and worshiped him. How is our worship today? The purpose of the wise men, this was the purpose of their journey. They had made their trip for one purpose, and that was to worship the Christ child. They had followed what they knew that they needed to do. They worshiped him. Part of their worship was giving gifts. And it's really interesting, and I know some of you have, have probably read these gifts and understand the meaning of these gifts, um, but there were several gifts that they gave. The first thing was gold. You think of gold and you think of royalty. You think of something that's fit for a king. They gave him gold. They gave him frankincense, which is a very costly perfume. It is... Um, recalling, or it should recall the incense that would the priest would burn in the temple. Okay, that basically the gold represents the fact that he is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The frankincense reminds us that he is our priest, he is our high priest. But then the myrrh that they gave really is an embalming substance, which represented the fact that he came for a purpose, and that purpose was to die for our sin. And so you've got gold, frankincense, and myrrh, each one of them representing something. King, priest, and sacrifice for us. From the gifts, we see that he is, that Jesus is our king, he's our priest, he's our savior. Mary and Joseph um, were a bit off guard. This was quite some quite unusual gifts for these men to bring to Jesus. The shepherds, just like the shepherds, the wise men bowed their knees and surrendered their hearts to the king. Over the Christmas season, many will travel by car, by plane, by bus, whatever. Um, you have an itinerary. Some of you don't really, you're going to stay home or whatever, and that's, that's fine. But we know what our destination is for Christmas. But what is the goal of our trips? Would you say that it's just to get to a final destination? And the answer should be no. Getting there is just the beginning. What will you, I'm sorry, what we'll do there is the goal. For the wise men, their journey was not the objective. The objective was to worship the Christ child. When sometime during the Christmas season, my family and I will go down, travel, we'll travel to her mom and dad's, probably on Christmas Day, and then the day after Christmas, we'll probably be traveling down to Alabama to see my parents. So we've got a destination we're going to, but the destination isn't, the purpose of our trip, getting to that destination. The purpose is to go and to spend time with family. Well, for these wise men, the end of their destination wasn't the, res the reality of why they were going. Why they were going was for the purpose of worshiping the Christ child. And so when we think about, yes, sir. Six months plus. Yes, sir. They went searching. That's right. And they found him in a house. They followed a star. Yes. Now, how, how did they go from finding the general location to the actual presence? <laughs> because they were searching for the star. But so the star led them to the house. Yes, that is correct. It was a special star that was provided by God to lead them to that place. 
But here's the thing. As they studied, see, these were guys that studied the stars, and they studied prophecy. Okay, These were very learned men. And so they knew, they knew that Christ was going to be born, but they weren't totally for sure. Well, they, they were sure within a matter of, uh, of days, I would say, as to when he would be born. Because uh, the Bible prophesied uh, that at a certain time the Christ child would be born. What, so time? what, were, what time? I don't know that time. Well, it, How said, they know? it said that from the time that the decree went out to do this, a certain number of days until the Messiah would come, right. and then a certain number of times till he would be cut off. I mean, it was very specific. And it said where? In Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. And it gave a star, and verse 9 said, it stood over the place where the child was, because the stars are given for seasons, for signs. I mean, like in Julius Caesar, when these storms and these stars and these things happen. I mean, the people knew these were like omens. And so, I mean, stars are given for signs, for royalty. Well, the star must have shown during the daytime, too, for them to travel. When this new star... Evidently it did. Because if not, they would have lost the star. They, they must have known that it went with these prophecies because they knew what they were looking for. Which is, is, there, is there a reference to the wise men elsewhere in the Scripture? Um, probably in the... Well, I don't know if it's in the other Gospels or not. I'll tell you what, I will find out for sure because I know it's in there. I've just got to find it. What? Um, what? About the wise men. It's right here. Well, I know, but I mean, other than I mean, right uh, here. Other than this incident. Right, right. right. I mean, is I mean, there wise men in the Old Testament or anywhere else in the New Testament? As far as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as, uh, far as a uh, reference to wise men in, in general? Uh -huh. um, oh, yeah. Like in the, in the Egyptians, the wise men, he called the wise men and they, they did the exact right. same thing. Or they couldn't do everything that Moses and Aaron. Yeah. And then Daniel, he was the wisest of the wise men in Babylon. Okay. Um, How about Isaiah they're, they're 66 wise men and that, that Psalm 72, on. 10 and 11? Do what now? The Jewish ones were the astrologers. Were the Isaiah, 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 astrologer. I have Isaiah 66. Is like a cult. So, so astrologer means in, 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 in our day, the wise men would have been called what? Um. Maybe astronomers. astronomers. Maybe, maybe some. Some people I mean, that study the stars. I mean, the We're not talking. That study the stars today are, are so are so like that too that they can they can they can look back somehow and so, see that but, a day but, in but time. I, but you said they were scientists. From the, from yes, from the, right. And so it, have, it would have to be astronomy. But here's the thing: there's a difference between astrology and astronomy. Okay, astronomy are study guys that people that study the stars. Actually, we're not talking see. about Leo and, Astrology. you know what I'm saying, the, your horoscope kind of stuff. That's not what we're talking about because that obviously is not really a good thing. Um, but, but astronomy is the study of the stars. So these were scientists. They were astronomers. Um, like Galileo. They were wealthy men because of the gifts that they brought to Christ. People that are trained can look at that and see. I mean, they could see that there was a day missing. And then they found it in the Bible. Oh, yeah, that was when God made the sun go back. Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, they were like, oh, that's the missing day. The when the day, when the time stood still, if you remember, uh, when Israel was in battle, and... Um, and then the other ten minutes, like when Hezekiah made the sundial go back to right. degrees. I mean, I, I can't explain it, because yeah. I'm not smart enough, I haven't been trained in that, but there are people who are... God has given them that yeah. brilliance to study the stars. Well, and, and even as it pertains to the coming of the Lord, it says... It basically says we don't know the day or the hour when he's coming, but it says you will know by the signs, talking about but, the stars. But it sounds like what you're saying is, of all the people in the whole world at that time, these three men, or however how many it was, were the only ones that were diligently searching. I mean, the rest of the paper was like, right. I'm going to get here when he gets That's there. it, well, yeah. There had been like a 400-year period where there hadn't been any... Any and, prophecies. And these prophecies three between the Old Testament and the New was, Testament. Out of the whole creation was the only ones that, that, that. And then John the Baptist. Had, had well, John the Baptist to, was. Put an ark to it. That pretty much is what I'm saying. Yeah. Because God honored their searching, He honored the fact that they were looking for Christ to come. And because of that, he honored them by saying, okay, you want to know? Here's a star. And you follow the star. And that way so they wouldn't kill him. Because as soon as they came to Jerusalem and started asking, then Herod, you know, it was, he, he said, from two years old and younger, to give the wise men time to get there and time to find them. 
and everything. So he killed all the baby bush from two years old and younger. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he'd make sure he'd get him, but he didn't. But yeah. I mean, if everybody had been ready, you know, like they. But, but it's kind of a scary thought. You know, yeah. I mean, as you preached Wednesday night, in other words, the the second coming is not much different than no. the birth. Exactly. As a matter of fact. And out of the whole world, there wasn't the three people yeah. that was prepared for the first coming. That's it. So, well, and, and that, by the way, that, it's kind of interesting because my message this morning is going to center around two passages. One's in Luke chapter 2. The other one is in Isaiah chapter 52. And so it, it's, I'm going to basically, for a few minutes, I'm going to parallel the fact what it was like when Christ was coming. They weren't prepared. And now in Isaiah, it tells the same thing. They're not going to be prepared for His coming when He comes a second time either. So I'm already preaching my message this morning. But anyway. Uh, but yeah, you're exactly right. You're right. And and I'm, I mean, that's... Yeah, I mean, that's something to think about. It makes a lot of in sense. In such now. an hour yeah. as you think not. The, the Son of Man coming. That's, that's it. What the Bible says. So if you don't think He's coming, that's when He's coming. <laughs> well, and, and I'll tell you something else. <laughs> the Bible says. I mean, and it should be scary, too, is how many, I mean, what you're saying out of all the people in the whole world, these three men, or how many it was, were uh, identified as the only three that were they're doing the right thing, that was looking. Yeah. They were the only one who recognized the signs. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, they're the only three that took it serious. Yeah, pretty well, much. I mean, some of those people might not have even been. I, I mean, mean, Herod was. He took it serious after the fact. No, you know. Right. Well, no, the shepherds did too. You know, might have just said, oh, well, yeah, but I mean, they didn't know. They didn't know anything about the birth of Christ until the angels appeared to them. Right. And told them, hey. You know, Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. So how did the... Yeah, if an angel appeared to me, I'd take it pretty seriously. <laughs> so how did the, the wise men know, you know... Because they, they studied Jewish. they studied prophecy. They, they knew the prophecies. Everything. Right. I mean, they probably knew. They were wise. They were... Well, and that's the thing. I mean, like they... Like Solomon, how did he know? Here's God the thing. Gave him that wisdom. God gives some people... Yeah. Some people have... Just, they're just smart. But but here's the thing, the, the, and this goes back to what Mr. Dean said. The Jews they had the prophecy too, but they weren't really looking for him. You know, I mean, it God prophesied in the Old Testament he's coming. You know, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. It, it, it laid it all out, but the Jewish people weren't really looking for him. But yet these Persian men, these Persian astronomers, whatever you want to call them, wise men, they were looking for it. They had studied the prophecies. And then they began to study the stars as it related to the prophecies, and, and they were searching for Jewish it. Jewish people had been taken captive to Persia. I mean, like Esther's husband, Hazarus, um, Daniel, you know, the Medes and the Persians. So maybe when some of these Jews were here, they did teach some of those people in Persia about it. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, because the Jews had been taken captive to Persia um, years and years before. Cyrus, Darius the Mede, yeah. Cyrus the Persian. Yeah. I mean, Jews had been there and had been at the top. Yeah. You know, so it's, you know. So how come we put so much emphasis on Christmas and his birth when Paul basically said celebrate his death and not his birth? Well, because Christ had, I mean, he came for a purpose. Right. Okay, and that purpose, he came. And his greatest purpose was dying for us. That's it. That's right. But we celebrate it because he did come. Right. But why don't we have this type of celebration at, at Easter? You should. We do. Well, we yeah, we, we celebrate the fact that Christ died for us. Right, but it isn't as big as Right, Christmas. I see what you're saying. In other words, we're not passing gifts around doing all this stuff. Well, I, you know, the gifts don't. Well, no. The answer is we're human. We've been humanized. <laughs> We've been humanized? <laughs> Oh, it's just a different type of celebration. Yeah, so. it's a different type of celebration. But with that, we need to pray because folks are coming. So let's let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity today to worship you, to study about your word. We thank you for those who uh, participated and who've talked about some things. And we thank you for the fact that um, they're learning and they're continuing to uh, ask questions and want to know about you. And Lord, we just thank you for our time together this morning. We pray your blessings on the service to follow. And just uh, may we worship you in spirit and truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.